me? Yes, sound is good. I can me... I can hear all you guys. Let me just get us going on Facebook real quick. And I am going to go ahead and start the webinar. So like I said, we'll give people a few minutes to come in and then we'll get started from there. Hi everyone, as you're joining us, please feel free to use the Q and, or excuse me, the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And please let us know where you're joining us from tonight. Uh, we'll get started here in just a few moments. Uh, so just take that opportunity, let us know where you're, uh, where you're tuning in from tonight. And if you are an aspiring photographer or filmographer or documentarian or any kind of artist, please let us know. All right, for those of you who are just joining us, go ahead and put your, uh, where you're tuning in from tonight and let us know where you're, uh, where you're joining us from. We'll get started here in just a moment. Okay. All right, well, it is six o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Erin Lomax, and I'm a marine science educator at the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystems Exhibit in Fort Pierce, Florida. And welcome to our last session of our program series, Art of Science, Conversations with Creatives in Science. Though the lines between science and art are often tightly drawn, these two disciplines can and do influence each other in extraordinary ways to create profound expressions through visual art and writing. This series seeks to highlight creative individuals with a scientific background in a conversation on how their scientific understanding of the world influences, enhances, and guides their art. Our program tonight will be conversational in nature, so not like an interview or lecture style program, and time will be built in for the panelists to give audience tips and tricks for aspiring artists, and audience members will be encouraged to ask panelists questions. Our session tonight focuses on photography and filmography. And again, while people are joining, go ahead and use that chat button at the bottom of your screen to let us know where you're joining us from today. So hello to Thorley from Seattle and hello to Andrea from Mexico. Thank you guys. Now, as everybody joins the webinar, I wanna point out some of the features. You can use the Q&A box to ask questions to our panelists. The Q&A box is at the bottom of your screen. It has two speech bubbles and you can submit a question at any time. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible by the end of the program. If you want a specific panelist to answer your question, please tell us which one. Otherwise, we'll pose the question to all three panelists. There is another educator on in the background to keep track of your questions. So if you see a message in the chat box, it will be coming from our digital programming intern, Jamil. And throughout the program, you can also use that chat box to send us messages and answer any questions that we might have for you. Your comments are only visible to Smithsonian staff, so please make sure to keep your comments on topic and appropriate. This webinar is being recorded and it's also being broadcast live on Facebook. And by next week, probably it will be archived on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to watch it again, or if you'd like to send it to someone else so they can see it, that'll be up on our YouTube channel probably next week. So tonight's introduction will, or excuse me, tonight's program will feature a short introduction by each of the panelists. And then we'll spend the majority of the time having a conversation about their creative journeys and taking audience questions. So just make sure that you're putting those questions in the uh, question and answer box. So hi, Charlie from New York City. And we have somebody from the Florida Keys joining us, Arlington, Virginia, California. Uh, another Californian is here as well. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you guys for joining us. 
Uh, and let's go ahead and get started. I, I wanna introduce our panelists for this session. So in no particular order, uh, Claudio Contreras Kub is a conservation photographer that has dedicated the last 30 years to bringing awareness to the public of the importance of nature and conservation related themes, both in his native Mexico and abroad in magazines such as National Geographic, Latin America and Spain, BBC Wildlife, Nature's Best Magazine and more. Our second panelist is Paul Clerken, who is a shark researcher and a filmographer whose work has led him to producing shark documentaries, leading workshops for the United Nations, and serving as a shark expert for a research cruise with the Food and Agriculture Organization. He's also currently working on his PhD at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Last, but certainly not least, we have Colin Ford, who is a coral aquaculturist, artist, and filmmaker in Miami, where he developed the world's first multimedia coral aquaculture studio, Coral Morphologic, bridging the gap between art and science by exploring corals in a relatable fashion. His work has been featured by the BBC, Nat Geo Channel, The New Yorker, Miami Herald, Vice Magazine, NPR, and the New York Times. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm really excited to, to learn more about your work and about your scientific journey. Thank you. So I think, let's see, I think Paul, you were gonna be the first one to give an introduction, correct? Yeah, I drew the short straw. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna turn it over to Paul. Uh, he'll give a little bit of an introduction and then we'll do the same for the, uh, the other two panelists as well. So. Paul, the floor is yours. Take it away. All right. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Paul Clerken, and I'm a PhD student at the Virginia Institute of uh, Marine Science. Um, and so when I was a kid, I was crazy for animals. Um, and I, I loved watching uh, nature programs. I loved, you know, animal books. Um, I'd always ask for them for Christmas or birthdays. But I, I loved uh, watching nature programs and um, the crocodile hunter. Um, Jeff Corwin, and I watched a ton of Shark Week. Um, and so I was always crazy for animals and um, I kind of, you know, didn't grow out of it and I wound up um, studying sharks. Um, so uh, I started off at a community college. This is me looking way younger. Um, and I, I went to a junior college for uh, about seven years, transferred on to Cornell. Then I worked in Alaska for a little bit. Um, then I did my master's at uh, Moss Landing Marine Labs and now I'm working on my PhD. Uh, at VIMS. Um, during my time at community college, I kind of, uh, I, I dabbled a lot. Uh, I took a lot of classes that I didn't need and I wound up leaving with um, five degrees, um, six transcripts from the different uh, JCs that I went to. And I also, um, I worked as a storm tracker. I worked at the uh, the Raptor Center at Davis uh, and a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of other things. And I think that was important because I, I found out how much, you know, I wanted to do marine science. I was actually pre-med for, um, a while, and uh, I, I always think my um, most valuable uh, volunteer position was at um, a hospital, and I, I found out that I hated hospitals. Um, and imagine if I had, hadn't done that and had gone through and gotten my, uh, you know, my uh, medical degree uh, and found out that I don't like hospitals. So um, yeah, so I dabbled a lot, and it took a long time, but I think it was a valuable experience. Um, and then uh, I, I did an REU um, at Rutgers, like uh, this is again, me looking super young. Um, and this was one of my first times doing like an actual research project. We spent a lot of time uh, at sea um, and we did some research that actually wound up being published. Um, and that was one of my first, uh, you know, publications. Uh, and that's when I decided I wasn't going to, you know, even try the medical thing. I was switching, you know, into uh, marine biology. Uh, so when I started at, uh, I actually started at Cornell um, a little bit early. A lot of people, uh, I didn't have all my classes fulfilled and a lot of people didn't think you could transfer to um, you know, an Ivy League from a community college. And I had one uh, professor who really encouraged me to do it. He was um, my uh, chemistry professor. He said, just apply. Um, so I wound up doing it and I got in and I, I loved it there. There are a lot of opportunities. Um, and even though I was a transfer student and I was only there for two and a half years, um, I was able to take advantage of a lot of different opportunities at, at um, other different field stations. So uh, I worked at Shackleton, which is one of their field stations for a little bit. Um, I was able to TA there and I really got to hang out with the grad students a lot, which I loved. Um, and I also 
went to Shoals and they had a marine laboratory uh, and a shark class. Uh, and I was with um, a friend, uh, a professor, Willie Bemis, who I still keep in touch with. Um, and I, I really enjoyed it there. Um, and then uh, I took a, a semester at sea. So I, we sailed from, um, from Mexico to Tahiti and I got a lot of hands-on uh, experience, you know, on a boat working at sea. After I finished at Cornell, I took um, a year off and I worked in Alaska. Um, and that was fun. This is when Deadliest Catch was cool. And I was like, yeah, I'm doing all this cool stuff. Uh, and it was great. I got to um, see a lot of animals and learn a lot about sampling and, um, and sampling design. Uh, then after that, I started my master's at Moss Landing. Um, and this was in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and we saw a lot of weird sharks. So this was from my master's. And it was mostly in taxonomy. It was identifying sharks. And we, uh, we were getting deep water sharks in an area that was poorly discovered or poorly studied. And we discovered about a dozen new species. Um, and that uh, kind of morphed into um, doing shows for Shark Week. Uh, this is not a, a real species. This is a, a you know an image. This is a, it was based on um, a, a, mu a mutation um, that they they found in an embryo. Um, anyway, so I, that's when I fell into doing uh, some Shark Week shoots. So this was a fun one, um, and we we found some new species on camera, which I think uh, was a first for Shark Week. Um, and then um, I just kind of did a couple of little shows for Shark Week. Um, then we did um, another, the next year they asked me like, what do you want to do? And I said, let's go look for mega mouth sharks. So uh, we hopped over there and this one was a little bit different because we actually had a camera crew and this is my first experience having like a camera in my face all the time. Um, but you know, it was fun. Uh, we got the shark and this was, it was a great way to, uh, to do the science and get the information out to people, um, you know, a lot of people very quickly and get them interested in the shark. So um, after that, we, I, I tried a travel series, which was a lot of fun. Um, we, we got a pilot, but we didn't, uh, we didn't get the, uh, the series. So we got one episode off, um, but this is one of the, the funnest projects I've ever worked on, um, again, with sharks. And then um, yeah, after, after that failed, I went back. Uh, I finished my, my master's, and I went back to Shark Week for a show last year. And now I am um, here at, oh, sorry, these are, that was an extra slide. We went back with some, uh, some new technology to tag sharks. We had an ROV and some deep sea cameras and a, and a video tag. Um, so now um, I'm back in academia. Uh, I'm working on my PhD uh, at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Uh, we are working on a couple uh, documentaries um, and most of them I've signed to NDA for, so I can't really talk about them. But you know, I'm, I'm back in school and hoping to continue um, to make documentaries kind of on the side. So uh, I, I hope I can answer any questions you guys have um, about videography or, or how it works. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I, I just had a quick question just as I was listening to, uh, to your presentation. I, I'm kind of curious, you said that you, um, you were pre-med for a while, you were, you were studying medicine. Um, so, you know, how, did that help at all with, with the research that you're doing now, especially as it relates to anatomy or taxonomy or anything like that? Uh, I mean, probably. Um, uh, so, I, uh, I just spent a ton of time at community college and uh, uh, I just took a ton of classes that I didn't need. But, you know, it's having that broad um, kind of, uh, you know, education, I, I think helps. I think all the time, you know, whether you realize it or not, sometimes like, you know, I'll be like, oh, I know something about this and it, it is helpful. Um, so, yeah, I don't know about medicine specifically, but uh, definitely some of the extra classes that I, I took for fun. Um, yeah. You know, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a lot of cross pollination there going on. So, all right, cool. Well, thank you, Paul. So, Claudia, we're gonna move on to uh, we're gonna move on to you next. And you want to go ahead and unmute as well. Yep. There you go. Um, just let me see if you see um, the manta. Do you see it? Yep. We see it. Okay, only the Manta, right? <laughs> um, I do see the the toolbars at the yeah, top. The yeah, didn't know how okay. to. Yeah, no, I just I just that, see so. the I just see the Manta. Yep. Okay, well, uh, hello everybody. Um, I'm Claudio Contreras Cop. I'm a nature photographer from Mexico, and well, to show you this, where's where's my? Yeah, there you go. Um, this is like the natural view of the place where I come from. 
if somebody has been to Mexico City, you, uh, you'll see that uh, Mexico City was built on top of a lake. So we've got uh, tons of problems still with that uh, centuries after that. And um, this is like the, the natural landscape. We're dominated by two volcanoes, um, one of which is active, the Popocatépetl volcano. And this is now rather the exception that, than the norm. But uh, in places like this, shrinking places like this, the endangered axolotl, um, an amphibian, um, still, still survives. It doesn't drive, it, it survives. It's endangered, right? Well, since I was uh, four years of age, I already knew that uh, I wanted to turn to nature, that my life was there and dedicate my life to it. So um, it was no surprise that I studied, finally studied biology. I studied diving and mountaineering all at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, Mexico's most important uh, university. There, um, as part of my biology courses, um, I studied photography and microphotography. And well, the, the presence of a camera in my hands really, really changed my, my life. Um, to show you, this is one of the earliest pictures, the oldest that I still like a lot. And pictured here is a Mediterranean gecko on a stained glass window in Southern Spain. So while, while I was studying, I left um, school for a semester and went down uh, with my backpack uh, to Europe. And I can still fondly remember that it took me ages to compose this image and make just one single slide. No? But nowadays, I mean, um, you would try to have like 20 different versions. No? And in that digital photography is like, is like, uh, like if you have a school in your hands because you're learning uh, at the moment that you're taking the images, no? Well, um, when I returned from that trip, I was committed to photography. I, I, I really uh, wanted to become a photographer. And um, I've been photographing now more than 30 years, mostly, but not only in Mexico. Um, I tried to cover all creatures, big and small, but I think my passion lies with uh, seabirds and, and islands. No? Um, I try to cover all the angles while doing a portfolio, not focusing on one single image, but trying to cover all the biodiversity of an island, as well as the changing seasons and so on. No? So this is, for example, uh, Guadalupe Island, which is world famous for, um, for white sharks. No. And when I focus on a species, I also try um, to focus on all the life cycle of, of the animal, like, like in these Caribbean flamingos. Um, change another one. Wait a minute. There you go. Okay. So in, I've been a, um, I've been a, a member of the International League of Conservation Photographers since 2009. And um, really being part of a group that think alike pe people and where you can, um, when, you, when, when, you, when you can have your ideas and, and have um, retroalimentation, do you say that, is that a word? <laughs> um, it's really, it's really, has been really uh, very good for my, uh, personal growth, you know? Um, well, I've been there since 2009 and, and um, photography is really an extraordinary way to promote conservation because you can translate uh, the experiences of the scientists. You can show what communities have to face and as difficult as it is, you can also change attitudes towards nature. Um, by the way, this image uh, was made in Honduras, while ILCP, the International League of Conservation Photographers, partnered with the Smithsonian. You know? And that was with um, um, 
well with with the Smithsonian and and other groups, but uh, yeah, mainly Smithsonian. So um, here you can see my uh, contacts and thank you very much. And just I'll be here for any questions uh, that you care to put. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Claudia. That was that, those are some amazing images. I love that. And something you said at the at the end kind of interested me. So I wanted I wanted to ask about it before we moved on. You said that you feel that uh, one of the one of the things your photography does is it shows the realities for communities and the impacts that you know either the nature degradation or nature restoration might have. So. Um, I guess my question would be, what are some of those messages that you hope that your photography gets across uh, about those communities? I would say that um, as a photographer, you have to choose which which is like your the style you 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 like the most. And uh, for example, in at the ILCP, we have um, colleagues that that do a lot of work with degradation and things like that. I tend to focus on on um, the positive message of um, conservation successes, like like the Flamingo Conservation uh, Program in Mexico, is very successful. It, um, there were like uh, five or six thousand um, flamingos in Mexico overall, and nowadays it's like uh, twenty thousand nests plus, which. Was, I mean, forty thousand flamingos and uh, and plus, no, because all the all the ones that are not reproducing. So, that kind of messages. Um, for example, I'm working with a scientist, a, a very long project for the reintroduction of the Socorro dove, uh, which is uh, which is extinct in the wild, and uh, well, the we have to cover everything as photographers, um, all the process of, of restoring the landscape, which was destroyed uh, by introduced feral uh, animals. And then the acclimatization of, of the birds to the island, to, to the new home, and then the liberation and so on. No? So those kinds of stories can inspire um, people to produce successes in other species and other environments too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's so important to, to celebrate those successes. Because uh, I, I think a lot of times we get a lot of doom and gloom. Um, you know, that's, that's mostly what we're hearing. And uh, so I think it is really important to highlight some of those successful conservation projects, because there's absolutely successful conservation projects in the world. There's even there's a lot of them here in Florida as well. I'm sure there's a lot uh, in Mexico too. So I think that's fantastic. I, I love that. And I, I love it that photography is a medium that really lets you trans, um, transcend language as well too, right? So you're, we had a, a researcher from the Smithsonian Marine Station, Steve Canty, just jump into the chat. And uh, he was talking about uh, you know, how important your, the work that you do is, is for them showcasing their work and reaching those diverse audiences. So I think photography, like I said, is a way to reach a lot of people, you know, that's, that's, uh, that may not all speak the same languages or be all from the same culture. So I think that's fantastic. All right, well, last but not least, I want to uh, hand, uh, hand it over to Colin Ford uh, for his introduction as well. So Colin, take it away. Okie doke, let's make sure sharing the right. Okay, so my name is Colin Ford and I am a marine biologist and the co-founder of Coral Morphologic. Um, we are based in Miami. We started in 2007 and Coral Morphologic is, is uh, really an attempt to hybridize the science and the art uh, around coral in an attempt to make them more relatable and understandable to the general public, because I think many people aren't exactly familiar with what exactly a coral is. You know, we know about coral reefs, um, but but I think a lot of the general public has there's a lot of misconceptions about you know where does a coral start, where does it end, where does a coral reef start, um, and so I. Uh, 
uh, came to Miami in the year 2000. Um, I got an academic scholarship to study marine biology at the University of Miami. Um, and I had already started aquaculture and corals in my bedroom in, in high school in the late 90s. Um, and you know the, the, the aquarium hobby had really helped to develop a lot of the techniques that were utilized, um, that are now utilized by scientists to uh, grow these corals in captivity. So when I got to the University of Miami in a, uh, the suburb of Coral Gables, which seemed like a no brainer to me where, you know, where else would I be going to, uh, to, to, to school than a place called Coral Gables. Um, expecting to find uh, other classmates and students and, and scientists and professors who also had an interest in coral aquaculture, um, growing corals in aquariums. And I was surprised to learn that the general consensus was that corals can't be kept alive. They're too sensitive, they're too delicate. Um, they shouldn't be kept alive in tanks. And it, and it really was kind of a, a sort of a cold water in the face uh, to, to sort of be so surprised at, at really the kind of the negativity around uh, the things that I was sort of hoping to do because, you know, obviously I'm, I'm dedicated to growing corals. And at the time uh, there was a lot of focus on how do corals die? Um, and, and of course, you know, corals, have, having grown corals for about two and a half decades, corals can die a lot of different ways, uh, sadly. Um, and growing them takes a lot of uh, patience and a lot of dedication and, and stability. Corals like stability, like all living creatures. Um, and so, you know, I, I sort of had an experience where a lot of my other classmates were interested in, um, you know, what they call the charismatic megafauna. I mean, if you think about uh, pop culture and the intersection of pop culture, you know, just Finding Nemo didn't come out until like 2002, um, which I think for a lot of young people now was sort of um, an important piece of pop culture that really got them interested in the smaller life on the coral reef. Whereas previously things were, you know, maybe a little bit, you know, the larger animals, the sea turtles, the whales uh, and dolphins. And, and so, you know, at school, I, I wound up spending a lot more time with some of the artists and, and the musicians at, at school. And in Miami, you know, it's, it's a city that's now known for its contemporary art community. Um, and, and so we would go out to these art walks and art galleries. And, and, you know, at some point I had this revelation that, you know, all of this artwork that I see on the wall, um, you know, these corals that I'm interested in studying are themselves like these living artworks. And yet here we are in a city that is surrounded by coral reefs. And in fact, you know, a lot of the buildings here are, you can, you can see coral fossils in, in the architecture and, and all of the cement that's used in South Florida to build these structures um, at one time was uh, alive uh, in, of marine origin. Um, and so you know, realizing that there, there really was a need uh, in a place like Miami to educate people as to um, sort of the, the deep space and time of, of, where, of where we are. You know, everybody understands Miami to be a place that's vulnerable to sea level rise, um, and global warming, and, and of course, you know, really the, the, the global coral crisis, the die-off in a lot of ways started here in Miami where the first coral diseases and bleaching was, was identified in the late 70s. And, um, and, and a lot of the problems that we see continuing today elsewhere around the world were, were really first uh, identified here. So in a lot of ways, I, I see Miami as, as sort, of a, sort of a cosmopolitan nexus of sorts. Uh, not just of pop culture, but it's also a confluence of, of, of North America, South America, the, the Caribbean region. Um, and the thing that really connects all of these cultures um, and, and people in the region is this marine habitat where we have um, very similar uh, assortments of species, whether you're you know, in Colombia or the Bahamas or Bermuda or, or Mexico uh, on the Caribbean side. Um, and so Miami, you know, is, is a place that, that has a, a lot of uh, you know, some of the best research institutions are in South Florida, uh, starting with Smithsonian, uh, FAU, Harbor Branch, uh, NOVA, FIU, um, and University of Miami. So, you know, at Boat Marine Lab, all of these places are, are down here in, in, in uh, South Florida. But there really, I felt, was sort of a need to be able to communicate the importance of this science. And I felt that 
the, the visual impact of the corals themselves. I mean, they're so hypnotic. I mean, I hope that as I'm talking, you, you kind of see the, the, the macro uh, world of the coral when you get up close to it. And, you know, and that, that sort of uh, has, has always been a, a challenge uh, you know, for coral morphologic is, is to, you know, an, an important part of conservation is often developing a connection between the humans and, and the creatures themselves. So, you know, you think of an archetypal icon of conservation like the panda. You know, they're, they're cute, they're cuddly, they make nice stuffed animals, um, they're adorable. And so, you know, these animals that, that, that have, uh, you can look into their eyes and sort of feel a connection to, you know, it, it's, it's not so difficult to build that type of empathic connection. But when you're dealing with creatures that don't have a brain and they don't have an eyes and, and sort of the, the traditional things that, that we as humans sort of uh, identify with, it, it maybe becomes a bit more difficult to, to try and develop that connection. So, so coral morphologic, you know, utilizing this imagery, um, I think, you know, and, and this is one of the things that, uh, many of the things that, that, that sort of around corals and the mysteries of the coral that we're still unraveling, there's still so much to learn about them, is this fluorescence. You know, in a lot of these uh, videos that you're seeing here with these corals that are, that are fluorescent, there are, this is a sea urchin, that's not a coral. Um, but we do, we do macro uh, critters on the reef as well. But this, this fluorescence is, is really something that uh, I think captivates people because they're almost like living black light creatures. And, and, it, and, and of course you think about Miami as a place of, it's, it's often associated with neon uh, nightlife, but it's sort of in an artificial sense. And, you know, oftentimes I think people have kind of a, a tacky, uh, uh, sense of understanding of Miami, but really, you know, it is the corals that were the original fluorescent nightlife icons uh, of the city. They built the city, um, and we are building, and we have built the, the these uh, structures out of the bones of their ancestors. So, you know, when you think about a coral reef, and and you realize that, you know, every single one of those polyps there is like an individual animal, and what we're looking at here is a whole colony of clones that together build these structures, which is in a lot of ways, you know, corals are the first city builders of planet earth. They build these complex urban environments that are very three-dimensional um, and, and these structures that they build, these reefs then provide homes for all of these organisms. So it's like they are themselves the real estate developers. They are building uh, these houses that people live in. And so these skyscrapers and high rises that we have in Miami are really not so different when you think about coral heads and bombies and things out on out on out on the reef, and so you know, our goal is really, um, you know, to try and, and 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 even though they they look so alien, um, and of course they're 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 beautiful and they have all this color, um, you know, there's actually a lot that we have in common with with the coral, and I think that our our primary goal here is not so much that you know humans are here to save the corals because they're helpless and they're delicate and they're uh, and, and, you know, they're, they're dying off around the world. I think really the, the main goal that we try to take with coral morphologic is, is this idea that corals have been on this planet for half a billion years. Um, and, and so perhaps they've survived multiple extinction events. And maybe there are things that we as humans can learn from corals and, and learn from these lessons on the coral reef that can help humans be more sustainable. You know, when we recognize that, hey, we're all in this fishbowl together, sharing the same water, the same air. Um, and that, you know, if, if corals are the canaries in the coal mine that are sick and that are, that are dying off, that you know, we need to realize we're in this coal mine with them. And so all, everything that's alive is, is in this coal mine. Um, and so, you know, hopefully through, through art and these videos that we create, we, we like to bring a sense of, um, of, of mystery and, and beauty, which art conveys. But if you want to go deeper than that, you know, you can, you can begin to identify these metaphors about the human condition and, and life in general. So, um, so that's, I guess, maybe my preface that I would say um, our approach, uh, my approach as a marine biologist that's, that's trying to convey, um, you know, more than just basic facts uh, to, to the public and really uh, captivate and, and entrance, which, you know, I don't have to work very hard at, the, at that because the corals do it do it for me. So, so I'm just sort of a, I'm just documenting what, 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 
is real in nature. So, you know, if anything, the takeaway is that nature is amazing and, and that we should uh, really put all of our efforts into um, saving and protecting these, these ecosystems and these animals because we are at a, at a critical point um, in, in history. Sorry about that. There we go. <laughs> All no right. Thank you so much for that, Colin. Um, I I loved how you kind of related that the um, that the colors of the corals were you know the original bright colored architects of Miami and that we're now living in in that environment that they created. I love I love that metaphor there. So true. And if we don't do anything about global warming and climate change, you know, a city like Miami and and its buildings made out of limestone become an artificial reef in the future, um, which is right. you know, this work that we see here is, is something that we, that we do um, as, as part of our kind of artistic repertoire is projecting images of corals back onto buildings to reference the geologic past, the technological present and, and, and the potential future if we don't, uh, if we don't get our, our fossil fuel emissions under control. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're more than welcome to, to play one of those videos if if you like. Um, so we sure. can take a look. Yeah. Um, I guess you know that. Um, you know, with, 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 I have a number of different videos that I that I could show, but but we I think maybe when if there's any any you know questions about about what we're doing, then I can I can do that. So maybe we we move to um, taking some questions or. or okay. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just a reminder to everybody in the audience, uh, make sure you put your questions in the Q&A box and uh, we will we will ask our panelists. I guess um, my first question is, is for all of you guys. And uh, some of you have touched on, you know, how you first got interested in, in the artistic medium that you're working in. But I'm curious, since all of you have a science background, do you consider yourself, were you a scientist first or were you an artist first? And then the second part of that question is, did you have a mentor? Did you have a teacher or a parent or a friend, somebody that maybe introduced you to this or encouraged you? So Colin, do you wanna answer sure. first? Yeah, that's a good, good question. So I would consider myself, I was always science oriented, always knew, you know, from a young age, I, I, I liked aquatic creatures, I grew up in, in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. So, you know, we have the smallest uh, coastline of any state. So, you know, was close enough to the ocean, but mostly freshwater stuff. Um, and I would say that um, my um, transition point that, that happened as far, as far as like being an artist, I was heavily involved in also, so I was friends with musicians um, and always been a big into music. And one of the things in, uh, you know, big into punk rock, I don't know if you, you can tell. So like you're growing up, uh, you know, listening, listening to punk rock. And one of the, one of the things that, that I, I really thought was great about punk rock is this, this idea of DIY, which now everybody knows means do it yourself. But, you know, in the eighties and nineties, this was a really radical idea that, you know, you didn't need a major record label. You didn't need to have, you know, a huge corporate machine behind you to be as successful as an artist. Um, and, and sort of as technology has developed, it's, it made things more uh, affordable and more accessible to the average person. And so for me, you know, like I, I look at the, uh, the work that, that, that Claudio has done and you know, starting with a, with, with a, with a film and, and, and with, with slides, I mean, you know, I, I, I didn't get my first digital SLR until 2006. I'd never, I've never taken a 35 millimeter film SLR photograph. And so I would say that we couldn't do coral morphologic had we started five years earlier because high definition video didn't exist yet. GoPro cameras didn't exist yet. Even YouTube didn't even exist yet. So, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, it's a synchronicity of time being in the right time in the right place where the accessibility of this technology and the camera equipment and then subsequently, you know, when HD video, when the Canon 5D Mark II came out and by that point had kind of learned the photography basics, you know, becoming a, uh, a videographer was no major leap, right? So 
I would say that a big part of, of you know, A, just being surrounded by other artists, that people that were not scientists was, was, was very helpful because then that, you know, you, you go from having a very objective mindset to, to, to one of, of, of more subjective. And, and I think also there was a, a moment in time in a, in a laboratory, I studied abroad at James Cook University in Australia and in a tropical crustaceans lab and we're dissecting hermit crabs or something. And, and I kind of had this revelation that, you know, to continue on down a road of, of, of hardcore science and, and academic work really means that you, you become a, an expert in a very small patch of whatever it is that you're studying, whether, you know, some rare species that, you know, that, and you can become a, an expert in that. And maybe there's only a handful of people in the world that are experts at that. But if we can't sort of take the, the, these sort of larger learning um, you know, how does that relate to the rest of the world? How, do, how does this research that you are doing, um, how can you inform and educate other people as to why this is important, or why we need to protect them? And so, you know, I, I realized that, you know, if you, you just focus on science, maybe sometimes it's really easy to get tunnel vision, where you're only focused on something very, very up close, and you, you might lose the bigger picture. And that, having the ability to kind of autofocus and zoom between, you know, the, the, the micro to the macro um, felt like it was a really important thing because you need to have the, the context to be able to explain what it is that's important to the general public, especially, you know, even in 2002, 2003, when I was realizing this, I mean, it was already clear that coral reefs were, were declining globally and that it was a crisis and that, and that really the, the communication of it. I mean, now we talk about SCICOM, like it's a thing that you just need, that that's a part of uh, everyone's kind of toolkit or on Twitter or whatever, but you know, it, it really wasn't yet a thing. And so I think that the, the art came from this idea of needing a vehicle to express kind of these more subjective thoughts about life, you know, because that's, that's another thing also that for me is this recognition, especially with coral, you know, um, was the scientists studying coral and a lot of this work is being done at the Smithsonian Marine Station with, um, the, it's called the hollow biont, right? So when you look at a coral, you're not looking at a singular organism, you know, you have that whole colony of, of, of clones and polyps, but then you've got, you know, a symbiotic algae that lives with that coral that provides it with energy from the sun. And then, you know, over the past decade or so, we've started to realize that, wait a minute, there's a whole uh, community of viruses and bacteria and fungus that are almost acting like a probiotic immune system for these organisms. And the most important thing about that is that then we turn the microscope back around on our, on our human selves and we realize, well, wait a minute, you know, humans are not just singular. We're not just, you know, I, but we are a whole community unto ourselves. So we are an ecosystem the same way that a coral is an ecosystem, part of a larger ecosystem. And so it's really important to also recognize that humans are not above nature. You know, and humans are not separate from nature, that we are, we are a part of it. Um, and that we too, our, our lives, you know, now we know, you know, you think about a, a metaphor everyone knows, like having a gut feeling, right? This is a metaphor of, well, you gotta trust your gut. And now we know that there's actual real literal science behind that because our gut bacteria is involved in neurotransmitters that are, that are affecting the way we think. And, and so, but we wouldn't have had that perspective scientifically had we not been looking under the microscope first at a coral to recognize sort of our place. And so that's another thing that I think is sometimes lost um, in science where, you know, sometimes it gets put up on a pedestal. Um, but it's important to remember that even as scientists, we are not outside of the reaction. We are a part of the reaction. We are in the reaction chamber itself. And therefore we are, we are a part of, everything's connected, right? So, I mean, it, it kind of gets a little woo woo, mm -hmm. but the reality is that we actually are all connected through bacteria. Yeah, I mean, interconnectedness is something that we talk about a lot um, at the Marine Ecosystems exhibit with our visitors and with students. Um, so thank you for that. I, I wanna make sure that I, we get yes. Claudio and Paul's uh, input as well. So for you guys, Paul, it sounds like, you know, you, you probably consider yourself more of a scientist than, than an artist, but I'm curious for, for both you and Claudio, you know, if you had a mentor and, you know, 
how much of a scientist, how much of an artist, uh, what your thoughts are on that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I mostly think of myself as a, a scientist or a researcher. I, I feel like it's probably just less um, exciting. You know, more people watch, um, you know, the shows than, than read any of the papers I've published. And I think, um, it's, you know, people introduce me as uh, doing documentaries. But yeah, I mean, it's always kind of a surprise because I do consider myself just a uh, mostly just um, focus on research. Um, but it has been really good for outreach and some of the stuff Colin was saying about getting people to care about the species you're working on has been um, really amazing for that, you know, because you reach a lot of people and I, I think it's, uh, it brings a lot of support. Um, and as for um, mentors, I feel like I've been very fortunate to have um, a, a ton. You know, uh, my parents were very um, supportive of, you know, any of these pursuits uh, when I was a kid and they, you know, they got me like animal books, animal kingdom books and, um, and then I think every step along the way um, from community college um, through the rest of my undergrad and, um, and uh, grad school. And then also even um, kind of uh, navigating the, um, the kind of weird world of, uh, of TV. It, you know, there's always been people who have uh, taken me under their wing have been um, you know, uh, just very helpful. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think without uh, that, I'd be in a different place, but there's, yeah, I, I think I've benefited from a lot of people just being um, very helpful. Okay, great. And Claudio, how about you? Well, um, I do uh, think that my, I found my language when I found the camera. So I really started uh, in biology and was in love with everything I was uh, studying. And we had very good courses in taxonomy. So you get to understand all the relations between the different uh, art forms, that, uh, uh, living forms that uh, are around us. But uh, when I got the camera, I mean, I was starting to think, uh, not all, but some scientists were more interested not in life, but in data. And uh, that was not my case. I, I, I was mm -hmm. interested in, in the individuals that I was seeing, sure. not the species or the data. And um, that was perfect with the camera because um, if you do things right, you don't hurt anything, right? Right. And um, well, that, that got me into, into photography it got me into writing my own articles because uh, I, I wanted to publish. Um, also, I also work sometimes as a picture editor and for books and so on. And all that, I, I could see what was easiest for, for people uh, to understand. So we're, we're like translators of um, scientist talk for the general public. And in that, um, Biology helped me a lot. Also, it helped me a lot in, in how to approach uh, creatures because the part of, of, uh, for, of biology I was interested in, I am still most interested in is uh, behavior. No? And uh, you learn to read the animals, you learn to read in, uh, inclusively the, the individual animals uh, which are different each each from the other, even if it's the same population. And by learning that, you can see if, if they are stressed or, or if you're approaching too fast or, or whatever. And in that also behavior, behavioral studies uh, um, helped a lot. As for mentors, well, I, I consider myself a photographer, um, although I have that scientific background. No? For, for mentors, well, um, Alejandro Martinez and, and Ana Isabel Bieler, my two uh, professors at the university, which gave this uh, photography and microphotography course. Um, well, Ana Isabel is still giving it. Um, well, those, those were my those were my mentors. Those were my guides. You no, know? and um, can tell you that uh, many of my images turned to the trash bin because they were worthless and uh, and. That's a way to study. That's a way to learn, <laughs> and and I'm I'm so very grateful to them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think a lot of artists and in, in a lot of mediums go through that. You know, they're they're not they're they're their own worst critics. You know, so they're going to throw out a lot of their work before they actually release some as well. And I I love that that you said you 
you felt like you found your language when you when you started working with the camera and you know some of what you're talking about is is familiar to me just as an educator uh when you're talking about things like scientific communication like okay the scientists have all this data now who's going to translate it into you know layman's terms and um get get members of the public to to care and to donate money towards their research or whatever um so i think that's very neatly where where that people of an artistic bent whether they have a scientific background or not can can fit in there kind of neatly so thank you guys so much we had a great question from robert uh that i'll pose to each one of you he asks what do you think or hope will be the next great leap forward in technology that will help you do your work? I know I have an answer to that for me. Yeah, go um, for it. So I'm, I'm very excited about um, this Starlink satellite uh, for internet. And so, you know, one of the projects that, that's been big for us this last year is the Coral City camera. That's the background behind me. This is an underwater live streaming camera at Port of Miami, uh, streams 24-7. You can watch uh, on YouTube, uh, or of course, all, all um, social media platforms for the highlights. But, you know, it's, a, it's been a very successful project, especially during the pandemic where people are at home, um, haven't been able to, to get out. It's a way to connect with nature. But it works here in Miami because we have the, the, the digital infrastructure to be able to provide high definition broadband video, right? So you can't really do this in the Great Barrier Reef because how are you gonna get this video stream on the internet? So, you know, I see that, you know, I mean, Elon Musk is sort of focused on Mars. You couldn't pay me to go to Mars. I mean, that sounds, to, to, to go where there's no liquid water to me is absolutely crazy. Um, but in a lot of ways, you know, you think about the, the astronauts that went, the Apollo astronauts that went to the moon, where everybody thought that getting to the moon was going to be this huge, amazing breakthrough. And really what it was for the astronauts was the ability to see Earth from the moon and see it all and recognize that, wow, everything that's alive is right there. So, you know, while Elon Musk might be looking at the moon, you know, I'm thinking about how all of the infrastructure of what he's doing to get there can be utilized to help us monitor Earth. And I and I like to dream of the future where, you know, we have these remote cameras, whether they're underwater, whether they're, you know, in the Serengeti, monitoring wildlife and, and being able to then make that uh, something that the public can engage in. Because when you have a whole uh, team of people casually or even, you know, kind of almost dedicated to watching these cameras and making observations. It's a really great way to engage the public in, in a sort of citizen science effort because and it also connects them with really remote locations, which is also, I think, a problem in a lot of conservation biology and ecotourism is people are always trying to get to the last unexplored places of the earth, right? And right. Before the tourists ruin it. But, you know, the actual footprints of going to these places really does take a toll diving on coral reefs. You know, if you go to the, the Florida Keys, the places that people have been diving the most are absolutely the most, you know, least healthy coral reefs. So if you can utilize things like cameras to still get people to engage in these environments without disrupting nature, because now, you know, it's just sort of a, a little spy cam underwater and we're not disrupting the natural, you know, goings about of, of nature. I, I think that, you know, once we have this capability of being able to stream from anywhere around the world, really remote locations, remote islands, being able to connect the, the, the populations of people that live in these places, I think will be, I, I hope, I hope will be the game changer to get us to recognize that we're sort of all part of this global human family. We're all in this together. Right, right. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I wonder, you know, cause I even look back just, you know, 10 or 15 years ago and the amount of streaming media that was out there was there was not very much at all and uh it was usually just like the the still shots you know and it would update every 10 seconds or whatever and yeah. it just it blows my mind that you know i can sit here and i'm watching this go on behind you and i just have to ask are those mangrove propagules that they're chewing on is that, sure. is that they're what they're chewing on mangrove propagules which is which is one of the unexpected discoveries of this past year that, that a lot of parrotfish love chewing on mangrove propagules which i don't think anybody 
I've never really noticed before. So. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we'd noticed it either. Okay, all right. Well, thank you. So, Claudio and and Paul, what what do you guys think is the next big leap forward in technology that's going to help your work? Well, in in terms of hoping, <laughs> no, first, um, because that's the question too. No, uh, what I think yeah. or I hope. Well, in terms of hope, I uh, I hope they build stronger cameras because. Uh, um, in the outdoors, we destroy a lot of equipment, and uh, um, especially, well, I, I do have that tendency. Uh, so I, I would love to have a stronger um, body and uh, and also the lenses and so on. Um, what I think, what well, well, well um, I, I'm excited about um, ISO, high ISO. Um, because um, to be able to shoot by night uh, uh, with uh, F-16 or, uh, I mean, <laughs> things like that, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. And it's coming. It's, it's coming very, very, very fast. So um, I'm not so much on the technology side, but that one would certainly benefit the kind of photography that I like to do. Yeah, it sounds like it. I, I'm kind of the same way, Claudio. It's I just I seem to destroy pieces of technology pretty regularly. So I feel for you. I'm still waiting for them to make an indestructible cell phone. I don't know if it'll if they'll ever make one strong enough for me, but that's what I'm waiting for. Yeah. Yeah, and, and much of this is because um, the industry, the, the camera industry, is not made for outdoors. It's made for mm. maximal for sports, right? Like sports is a good. Uh, business for them but uh, models and things like that that's where they're mostly concentrated and and that's a very safe environment for for cameras usually yeah but no, the outdoors point. is is just something different yeah and it's unpredictable especially you know if you're working in and around salt water you know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure if your equipment is not well protected it it degrades pretty quickly very uh, with that yeah paul have you found the the same thing to be the case like you, you kind of wish that just the camera hardware technology itself was was a little better, or do you see another leap forward coming? Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm I'm sure that's the case. I, I don't do. Uh, I'm usually not doing a lot of the filming. Um, so, uh, but I, I think as for exploring uh, exploring the deep sea, um, I think there's going to be a couple um, advances. Ro anything with robotics to to get to the deep sea is obviously important. Um, AI, um, as, especially for identification of some of these hard to identify species. But I think um, eDNA is going to be huge, um, which is environmental DNA, um, which is, you know, especially in the deep sea, just suspended uh, cells from fish or sharks or whatever um, animals down there. And then you can pass that water through a filter and pretty much figure out what's in the area and in what relative abundances. Um, for areas that are very remote, or hard to get to, um, or you know, don't carry researchers. The idea of being able to take a, a water sample and get an idea of what's there and um, how many of them are there is uh, it could really revolutionize our understanding of the ocean and um, potential uh, for monitoring fisheries. Yeah, that was kind of my first thought. Like, wow, I wonder if, if they would use that if it got to the point where it was an almost instantaneous reading. Uh, you know, how often that would be used for fisheries. I'm assuming it would be used all the time for something um, like that. I think if this becomes instantaneous, then like, it, yeah, it'd be very useful. I mean, it's useful for other reasons too. Like it can, uh, because it's so sensitive, it can uh, detect very rare species. You know, if you do a lot of the time when people do research, they do um, a trawl, they'll drag a net through the water and they'll catch everything. Um, and it's expensive, it's time consuming. It needs a expert on board to identify and count these fish. Um, and you know, it's also can be impactful for the environment. You know, you're towing a net through the water, you can destroy habitat, you can kill animals. Um, and the idea of like, you know, taking a, pretty much a, a bottle of water and getting the same work done uh, is it's so cheap, it's so fast. And you could in theory, just have um, commercial fishing vessels collect water and you could go from, uh, instead of hiring a scientist to go out occasionally you could be monitoring pretty much uh you know everywhere that a boat is fishing yeah absolutely especially if it can measure something like population density and track it over time right so you can see if a fishery is recovering or not too that would be a really interesting um, use of that technology as well 
Well, we had another really good question from the audience, and um, it's it's an interesting question because it's something that um, we have to deal with quite a bit at the Smithsonian, um, kind of walking a fine line between, you know, where some of our income comes from, um, you know, from grants and from government and things like that, versus you know being an advocate. So this person asked, "Do you think that you and other science science communicators?" have a moral obligation to be an advocate on climate or environmental issues, um, or do you guys have to tread a line carefully? I mean, I, I, we're 100% in a global climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis, the house is on fire. <laughs> yeah, what more can you say? You know, you, if, if your house was on fire or any part of your property was on fire, you're probably gonna stop whatever recreation you're doing and get down to business and try and put the fire out. And I think that, um, you know, that it, you, you touched on it earlier, you know, within the coral science community, this is a, this is a very sensitive topic where, you know, so many great strides have been made in coral restoration. Of course, you know, Coral Restoration Foundation and the Florida Keys, the pioneer had tremendous uh, success. Um, you know, there's been breakthroughs in spawning of corals and, and being able to, you know, produce thousands of larvae. And a lot of, especially older scientists, uh, don't like the fact that a lot of the media that covers these types of uh, you know, new developments, they claim that it gives people a sense of false hope. That basically they argue that you need to be doom and gloom to get people's attention. But I think that one, that it goes both ways, that if you are too doom and gloom and you tell people, oh, well, you know, there really is no hope. I mean, why would anybody bother trying at that point? And right. People yeah. are already so overwhelmed with any number of stressful things in their daily lives that to take on these larger existential crises is, is, is asking a lot. And so, you know, it's, it, as you say, it's a really fine line between, you know, do you, do you want to give people the, 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 the sense of, of, of complete hope and optimism, um, or do you want to, to try and alter their behavior by, um, you know, making them, uh, you know, feel bad? And, and, I, and I don't think that you can make people feel bad and get the outcome that you want. And obviously that there's, there's a balance there. So, so yeah, I, I think that um, we do have an obligation to let people know you know, that if we can use art as a way to get their attention, then there's this larger conversation that needs to be had. And we need, we need all hands on deck, right? We need the young scientists to go out and work on coral restoration, work on coral probiotics and, and, and coral diseases. But, you know, we need this larger conversation too about uh, global warming and, and fossil fuels and, you know, cryptocurrency and, and carbon footprints and, and all of these things that, um, just sort of just need to be kind of all pulled into a bigger conversation and the bigger the bigger picture. Okay. All right. And how about you, Claudio? Yeah. Um, well, absolutely. I mean, the house is on fire, as he said. Uh, absolutely, we have to be advocates for for environmental protection. The, the thing is, like um, I mentioned earlier, you, you you can choose the way you want to. Um, to report about it. You can report the bad things that are happening. And it's also important to report when, when good things are uh, happening uh, in places. I mean, I don't know if you know, for example, um, the example of Cabo Pulmo in Mexico, Mexican community in Baja California, you know, where, where the community decided not to fish any more fish in their waters. Absolutely none. So, that was like 20, 25 years ago, maybe. And, and, and the result was very, very painful first years where nothing was happening, where they changed to tourism and, and diving and, and things like that, but nobody knew them. And besides, it was not very different than any other place, right? But they, they, uh, they made the effort, they stood there, their ground, and nowadays 
it's like a 500 percent more fish uh, volume in in the waters you go there and it's it's a top spot now and now they have to to tell um, tourists that they cannot come more because they have a, a quota a limit of divers for the year so as not to uh, endanger the coral those things can happen everywhere but you need to uh, give these positive messages too for people to know how uh, how to do it. Okay, yeah, no, I, I agree. It's it's a you know as you said in your introduction that it's important to to show those successes as well, um, and to to be an advocate not only when you see something going wrong, but an advocate when you see something going right as well. So, Paul, did you have any thoughts as well? Um. Yeah, well, you, you know, uh, I think it's kind of a complicated question. I, I mean, I think there's obviously, um, you know, the wanting to educate people and, and get a, um, a response and support out of people. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of people would argue as a scientist, you deliver the facts. Um, and I, I think the question isn't just about as a scientist, you deliver facts, but I think it's as a scientist um, with an opportunity to reach the public, do you just deliver the facts or do you try to you know, get them engaged. And I, I think like uh, all of us were talking earlier, um, it is an opportunity for us to get people engaged. You know, you, I think you can still do the science uh, and also um, inspire people to, to do something or take action. Um, I, I think, you know, whether you're showing um, positive or, or negative, you know, how bad things are, doom and gloom, which has been done a lot, uh, or positive outcomes, uh, I think it's it's a, a good way to get people um, educated and involved um, as long as you aren't uh, sensationalizing it or um, you know uh, exaggerating, which I think um, some some groups do. Okay, yeah, no, I, I think those are all great points. So um, that kind of it leads a little bit into into our next question as well, which is um, who if you guys have heroes or favorite creators that are in this field, and maybe they inspired you, or maybe you just enjoy seeing their work. Um, so, is there a scientist or an artist or some sort of creator that you know you you guys really resonate with? That's that's kind of inspired you. Well, um, I have a ton because uh, there there's there's so much creativity out there. No, and nowadays with uh, with social media and so on, you get to to know that there are other people doing people that doing the kind of photography that you do. When I started, that that was not the case. I, I mean, I had to go to the bookstore to to find the magazines and and find out about uh, any photographer. And especially in Mexico, there were no photographers. There were two two full time photographers when I, when I when I arrived that did nature. And uh, then so one day I went to the bookstore and I saw a book about a competition, the wildlife photographer of the year. And that was volume one. <laughs> and uh, Franz Lanting won that. Uh, so I, I, I was instantly hooked into his photography and still, still am. He's, he's an incredible artist. Um, Art Wolf. Back then, in those times, well, well, the times where Art Wolf, Franz Lanting, Jim Brandenburg were like the top pros uh, in wildlife photography. And for example, Galen Rowell and, and uh, Jack Tekinga, uh, marvelous photographers in, in landscape. And well, Jack still does photography and Galen passed away. Um, Brandenburg and Wolf and Lanting are still producing beauty, you know? Nowadays, I, I think uh, I, I see a lot of uh, images that I, that I that I um, work that I like a lot. But if I have to just name three pe three people, I would be um, Stefano Untertina from Untertina. I don't know how you, you spell that, but Stefano Untertina from Italy and uh, Vincent Munir from France. And uh, for underwater images, uh, Angel Fitor from Spain is wonderful, wonderful work. Okay, great. So 
Colin and Paul, do you guys do you guys have anybody that uh, whose work that you you really admire or that inspires you? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I didn't know about when we started Core Morphologic and started making these films um, is a, a French filmmaker from a century ago. Uh, his name is Jean Panlevé, um, and he was basically doing very very similar uh, style and approach where he was an I think exposed to, you know, at the, at the moment that Dada and, and surrealism was, was sort of taking place in, in Europe and France. And, and, you know, there was a lot of artistic overlap uh, and inspiration. And, and he was, you know, this is the advent of underwater. I mean, he was a pioneer of underwater cinematography and, you know, and, and utilizing aquariums as, as, as sets, but also doing under work underwater. And, um, you know, I highly recommend that people look, I'm sure you can probably find on YouTube, uh, really amazing black and white uh, films of seahorses and sea urchins and octopus. And, um, you know, it, it's surprising to me because I feel like he kind of disappeared and, and nobody really re re replaced him. You know, I feel like Jacques Cousteau kind of became the archetype of sort of the ocean explorer and, you know, much sort of more um, a little bit, you know, a little bit more out, out in the, out in the water being brave, I guess, became kind of the, the thing that really inspired people starting in the sixties and then, you know, sixties, seventies, eighties, but, you know, really, you know, the, the artistic approach, uh, that was taking place, um, a hundred years ago. I mean, and there's, there's an interesting book, uh, I think called Coral Empire. And the author basically proposes that glass skyscrapers, in the 1920s are uh, as a result of kind of people's uh, uh, understanding of the coral reefs that, that were just be beginning to be understood in the Bahamas. I mean, you think about before a hundred years ago, I mean, the ocean was a dark, dangerous place where sea monsters existed. And, you know, we're one of the reasons why people like to go to coral reefs is because the water's crystal clear, which means that you can see whether there's any danger Right, being able to see in the water gives you a sense of safety, um, and so the when people first started going to the Bahamas and these tropical places, it, it, it immediately fed back into into our culture in a variety of different ways. And so you know, I, I find it so interesting this idea of like these glass skyscrapers are in a lot of ways sort of like the inverse of an aquarium where you're looking out through these glass windows. So um, yeah, a lot of a lot of like things that were taking place a hundred years ago that we are now just sort of like beginning to understand that, that impact and, and kind of returning a little bit to kind of some of those uh, surreal um, worldviews. Yeah. And I, and I love it that, you know, you can go that far back in, in your, your influences and your, your interests in the, in those creators and that, you know, it's a hundred years later and we're still talking about them. So yeah, yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. Paul, did, did you have anything uh, you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, when it comes to, to researchers, it's probably uh, too many to list, you know, uh, just going through the, the papers. But um, for um, documentaries, uh, yeah, when I was a, a kid, I would just wanted to eat as many episodes as I could of, um, you know, The Crocodile Hunter with um, Irwin and um, anything mm -hmm. with uh, Jeff Corwin. And then, of course, um, Jacques Cousteau and um, David Attenborough. Um, you know, I feel like that kind of really made me want to just go out and see uh, animals, just, you know, um, yeah, explore areas and, and see and learn about animals. So for me, it was, it was mostly uh, that kind of thing. Well, sometimes the stuff that you watch when you're a kid can have that huge impact. You know, that's, we, we always say uh, at the aquarium that scientists are, are made before middle school and they, it's, you know, you can, you can incite that curiosity in a child uh, for the natural world, you know, that's gonna carry with them for the rest of their lives. So yeah, I love, I love all of those uh, influences. So a lot of people in our audience, you know, they might just be starting out, they might be interested in, in photography or filmography. So I wanted to get everybody's feedback on um, how somebody could get started in photography or filmography. How do you get started? What kind of equipment do you need? What's your best advice for them? It's a great time to, to, to learn 
photography. I mean, to be honest, uh, now with my, between my iPhone, I use my iPhone a lot and it's great. Um, I use GoPros a lot, you know, you know, I, I think about, and I'm sure Claudio is much more, you know, the amount of equipment that he's had to, to bring around. And, you know, it's, it's a lot to, to be a professional photographer and go to remote places. It's a huge amount of equipment. So to be able to just grab a, a, a little GoPro or just have a, a, a phone in your pocket that you can grab, I mean, probably more than, my, from my perspective, you know, more than half of photography is just simply having an eye for kind of knowing what you might want to frame and, you know, and, and, and so it doesn't really matter whether you've got $20,000 worth of equipment or, you know, a phone that you use for your everyday things, you know, I think that, that really like any art, you know, there's an expression and there's a, there's a personal uh, element um, that, that will become revealed, you know, through, through the work, regardless of, of what you what you're utilizing for technology. Yeah, absolutely. And Claudio, I, I am interested to get your input since, you know, you've been a photographer for such a long time. You were a photographer way before iPhones and GoPros and, and all of that. Um, how would you, how would you uh, mentor somebody or give them advice on how to get into this industry now? Well, um, the thing is, uh, nowadays you have uh, the school in your hands, right? You're seeing instant results. You, you're, you're watching, oh, this is burned out. Oh, this doesn't work or this is blurry or, or whatever. And if, if you pay attention to all your faults, you will learn um, to, to get around them and, and get better images. So it's not, the, it's not that you need all the equipment of the world. You need to know the possibilities that the equipment you have gives you. You need to photograph photograph, photograph, watch the results, be very, um, be very tough on yourself. Uh, this works and I like it because it works because of this. This doesn't work out, I don't like it. And it doesn't work because I did this wrong, right? And also uh, look a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, images. Um, you can learn so much for, from photographers that are around you. And uh, now with uh, social media, it's, it's so easy. It's so easy. So you see more images and you start uh, to train that eye. That's, uh, like he said, you, 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 you can train your eye to, to be instantly recognizing where a good picture might be made. You know? So it's not the tons of equipment that, uh, that you need to have, but that you know how to use them. Right. And just that practice, that repetition over and over and over again. Yeah, no, I think that's really important for, for any, any artistic medium. You know, if somebody wants to learn how to play the piano, they just, they have to practice a lot. If they want to be a writer, they have to practice a lot. And probably a lot of that, that early work that each of you did probably wasn't very good. Right. I mean, you know, it normally isn't if, if you're, if you're just learning, um, how long did it take you guys to get to the point where you, you felt confident enough um, to approach others about opportunities or to get feedback on, on what you're doing? And maybe we can start with Paul. I, I know you said you, you don't do a whole lot of the uh, filming itself, but if you're around it enough, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you have some insight on it. Uh, <laughs> I, I do not have insight on it. Normally I'm on camera. <laughs> Uh, and I'm never used to doing that. I'm, I'm always nervous. I'm nervous now. I'm just uh, not a, a, you know, um, a, a natural, um, you know, outgoing public speaker. But um, it, it is rewarding, you know, to do. And I, I think you get a little bit better at, like, you know, figuring out what kind of um, stuff, you, you know, you can talk about that's engaging to the public. Because, uh, you know, I, I study um, taxonomy, which is not uh, very, very exciting to, you know, most people. But there are, you know, taxonomy of sharks, and I can talk about what I think is interesting and, and why. And so that's that's sure. maybe where I, I started improving. Yeah, no, and I, again, I think that science communication, that component is is crucial, you know, especially to guys like you who are who are also doing your own research. Um, so I had a question about, you know, especially when you're just starting out, um, do you guys feel like it's important to be part of a community? Uh, to get ideas or to get feedback, 
or I know a couple of you guys have talked about developing your own kind of your eye or your artistic voice. Do you feel like that's more important to develop those types of skills on your own or in a community? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Well, I think I think a community is, is very important, but um, the way to approach a community is, is with humility, because you have to be very open to critics, and um, bad critics doesn't mean that you you lose a friend. It just his point of view he might be wrong or he she might be wrong, and it's just one point of view. But it's a point of view that if you take um, take consideration of, of the words. Uh, being said, you can learn from it. You can learn from it and, and uh, make yourself a better photographer. I mean, if you're isolated, you might not see, uh, you might, might not see um, what's your failure in, in, in a picture. I see it a lot when I, when I, when I see portfolios of photographers. Some photographers that I do know and uh, and then they submit a portfolio and i watched it and i watch it and and i can't can't understand why he sent or he she sent those pictures and not the ones that are really strong and tell message and tell uh, tell a story so in that way uh, if if i said those comments this person could uh, probably probably take it to to heart and and grow or or I might be wrong, and I will be learning. So that's that's the that's the thing. Uh, you learn from from everybody. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, social media, Instagram is a pretty great platform. I think you know your chance if you're just getting started out. Chances are there's someone or multiple people making imagery in the realm that you might want to 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 work in, and and you know I think just Having having the influence of, of that and seeing what you like and you know, I, I think that, that that helps, you know, I think like with anything, social media and internet has really accelerated the speed at which somebody can advance, you know. I mean, I, I keep going back to you know Claudia taking all that time to to frame a picture on a on a uh, on a slide film, you know, and, and I think about, you know, I went to Bali, I did a working in Bali uh, for a nonprofit. I had the opportunity to get a digital SLR camera for one of the first ones that came out and I could see underwater the pictures that I was taking. So like you said, I could see, oh, it's blown out. You know, I could erase it right there. And, and to think of, you know, how long it might take where you go on a remote place with film and you take all those pictures and then you got to come back and then you got to develop it. And then you realize, ah, I had the setting wrong. You have to go back to try and get that. And nowadays, you know, it's so almost instantaneous to your own feedback, other people's feedback to, for the inspiration of things that you might want to attempt based off of seeing somebody else's work. So I, mean, I think it's, everything is, has accelerated. You know, the technology is a lot more accessible. It's a lot easier to use. The editing software is a lot easier to use now. So hopefully now it, it's really becomes a function of having fun, right? Because it's not, if you're not having fun and it's not enjoyable and, and you don't like you know, you know what it takes to get out into nature to take these pictures in the first place then you know maybe that's not uh, the best pastime so you know i think that that at least now maybe you know we can enjoy, maybe enjoy things a little bit more which is which is good um and then focus more on on the environment and, and, and being less intrusive into these worlds that we're trying to document Okay, yeah. And Paul, I'm, I'm kind of curious. I, I know that you've done a lot of presenting and, and uh, a lot of hosting of, of programs and things, and that you also say you're kind of you're kind of shy. So how important is it in, in you know, your line of work uh, to have that network of people that, uh, that help you with that or that provide you opportunities to do that? Oh, did we lose them? Oh, no, there he yeah, is. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, you, you, you froze there you? for a few seconds. Uh, I, okay, I bet I was like mid-blink. That's the only way that it freezes for me. 
Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, no problem. So, you know, we're talking a little bit about um, how important or maybe not important it is when you're first starting out to have a community around you of people that might be able to give you feedback or share ideas or share opportunities. And I know for you, it sounds like you've done uh, a lot of presenting on programs. So from that angle, how important is it for you to have that professional network of people? Um, I mean, I think... Uh, especially on the science side, it is very important. That's a, such a great way to get information. Um, and I remember when I first first started doing even um, just very small things, people would like give me like little uh, facts that I can say. And so that was helpful. Um, and on the, you know, uh, plus side, it's, there's a lot of communities um, in the science world, in the shark world, you can join, whether they're um, just nonprofits or, um, you know, just shark fan groups and even the scientific groups. You can go on um, and join the, com uh, the communities online. You can join the um, professional shark communities and you can, you can learn a lot. And, um, and that can also lead to you know, opportunities in the field and just opportunities to learn. Okay, awesome. Well, um, I, I wanna wrap things up because believe it or not, uh, we're getting close to the, the end of our time here. Uh, so Jamil will be putting uh, some information in the chat about uh, our website, uh, our social media, where you can keep up on what's happening. But I'd like to ask our panelists to uh, each give just a very short piece of advice. If somebody was just starting out, what's your one piece of advice for aspiring creatives? Experiment, practice. Experiment, Experiment and practice, okay, love it, all right. Yeah, I would say um, perseverance and uh, optimism. You know, I, I think just keep trying and uh, and also enjoy trying. I think if you uh, don't enjoy the process or you're not into reading scientific papers, um, it's, it's going to be hard. But if you enjoy it and you keep trying, um, I, I think that's the, the best thing you can do. Okay, great. I love that too. How about you, Claudio? I don't know what to say. Uh, so so uh, <laughs> just a few words. Um, but I mean, probably, I mean, aside from what, what was already said, um, probably if you have an image that works with one creature, try another angle, try another light, try something different, try doing a portfolio of, um, of different techniques, different, uh, uh, situations of the same, of the same subject. And that way you will uh, start improving and seeing further and further possibilities. Okay, great. Yeah, I love that because scientists, you know, they experiment, right? So why not to do that in a uh, artistic medium as well? All right. Well, I want to thank you guys so much for joining us. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, I loved hearing about your artistic journeys and uh, I know the audience appreciated it as well. Uh, so Jamil has added the, uh, the links to our social media and to our websites in the chat. Please feel free to check those out. If you have any questions about anything, you're more than welcome to email us. Our email is smseducation at si.edu. Uh, so if you didn't get a chance to ask your question tonight, uh, please feel free to email us. But Colin, Claudio, Paul, again, I want to thank you guys so much for, for giving us part of your evening and best of luck to, to all three of you moving forward. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for having us. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys. All right. Bye. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks.